Hello, welcome back in the waters. Today, we're going back to the East Rift. We will find more. We'll be able to scan those little running fellas and find out what happened inside free. Um, it's so long since we've seen this bright blue and yellow. In so long. We need to use our thrusters again. I've observed these creatures have a bright tail lure made from many thin pointed blades. What is its purpose, I wonder? Uh. Hey, he's running away. Oh, he touched. So I don't have to go here. We've met this one. Uh, we keep bumping to the same one. I'm not going to win. I don't worry about the fuel. I took lots of samples because we should have enough. Each pillar. To be very careful in trying to get them. These pillar worms, they seem to have burrows all over this place. These long segmented creatures with distinctive bright tails burrow into the hard rock of the pillars to protect themselves. Another two. No, we're meeting lots of them. Uh, 
Okay, I have to get the photo over here. What are we looking at here? This appears to be a huge colonial life form. Is this what remains of the site one facility? Let's cut it open. It was site one, not site three. But if I see correctly, that we could have just went all around. Should be fine. Behind the barrier, the throbbing tower of the colony is revealed, filled with throngs of Zoids acting as one. This golden colony is overwhelming. Where do we even begin? Thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Zoids make up the shifting interior. It seems that the Zoids are split into specialized functions and forms. Jellyfish like many Zoids do to balloon like bladders of gas. Beneath this translucent webs of spherical growths, the half digested wall sits suspended like an exploding moon frozen in time. I've never seen a colony creature of this scale or complexity. Can it really be one single united creature made of ever shifting, proce ever -shifting processes? The interior of this creature is like a golden bubble, the light trapped and refracted by hundreds of pearly orbs strung together. This colony breaks the surface 20 meters above. It must be floating on the surface, its body descends from areas like a living iceberg. Between the rugged parts of the facility stretch looping bridges, pumping liquid back and forth from the heart of the colony. The walls are a flowing mass of them because some have broken away and are floating through in the water. Might be able to extract them. Tiny metazoid creatures are budding from the walls here, splitting off from luminous stand to join the flow. Now something is too arrogant. Just because he discovered artificial doesn't mean he can decide their fate. Sam, he wants to free them. And what do the artificials want, Hama? Has anyone asked them? I'll call this colony Ratis. It flows beautifully across this ocean like some impossible vessel. A vast colony creature made of thousands of specialized zoids. It flows freely in the ocean, its upper section right in the ocean's surface. Eaten away on one side, the remains of the Sapa, like an open set, a staging ground for the colony's process of sublimation. Why would the colony preserve the room of the facility as it consumes them? What bizarre processes are in action here? The whole structure of the colony allows water to flow throughout its core, creating both bulbous corridors and open halls. This piece of the lab falls in gas filled bladder. So it's of bladder so it's keeping it warm. Some fault in the open water to prevent something from the dancing. We can just use this. We are rich in oxygen. These shoals of golden light look solid as a bird, but passing through they are little more than flowers of petals caught caught in the car. Maybe we should go back. 
my face in the blue far away in the center right now that is so I think there's something else something about it here the central laboratory is almost complete apart from the large tree like growths cutting from the soils We can't let this continue. We never intended this. That thing they are building... I know. Constantine has already left for Site 2. If the facility fails and Site 3 is breached, the oceanic mine can be stopped. Dappled light fills the chamber, passing through its compass bridging strands, orb orbited by swarms of zoids. This looks like a biologist laboratory. It must have been the first exploratory base on the planet. They discovered the artificers, they started all of this. These were scientists like me, employed by Baikal to study this place. How did it end like this? The mines they were building in the archaeology, the genetic research they were doing here, they were all working towards something, something bigger than just one lab. How could they have let this happen? These, these biologists, our first contact turned into a resource grab. Scan all you can and then let's leave this place, or review everything back at the base. It won't be long before the colony eats this place away once and for all. Maybe for the best. Surely for the best. I wonder whether we will be able to go back to the entrance, because I think there was something to the left. The ocean stretches east from here, a blue desert beneath three red suns. What my light out there beyond the range of this suit? More gas bladders holding the remains of the lab in place, like the pieces of a torn map hinting at the history of a long lean structure. That is absurd, Kevin. They are no different to us, adapting their environment so they may survive. No, they are not us. The artificials are gardeners, not colonizers. They rewrite genetic code to develop mutualism, to foster life. Some, from some angles, the zoid clogged walls of the facility line up and I can imagine the past life of this place with all its human dreams. A fragment of a room, eaten away into some strange sculpture, hanging in the blue. It's hard to imagine what this place once was. Each zoid has a function within the colony. There flow back and forth evidence of some complex process that is impossible to parse. The vague shape of the facility's walls is preserved by the colony, the spaces between filled with shifting swarms of life. So I guess we've been for all of it. And I, what I took at the beginning for a tree was the main room. And we are ready to go back. Mm. 
online again? Good, we have a lot to talk about. I've been digging through what we discovered at the facility. I was right to assume that the facility was the first base on the planet. The start of all this. The lead biologist, Konstantin Hess, found the artificials here more than 30 years ago. But what is truly incredible is what he discovered they could do. Genetic reprogramming, rewriting RNA and DNA both in themselves and their local environment. Some Earth cephalopods could rewrite their RNA, but nothing at the scale or detail. The artificial standard to this world, nudging its life into new arrangements. Not only that, but their exoskeletons, they were quantum computers. Silicon wafers of incredible complexity and purity, able to simulate the outcomes of their genetic rewriting. The artificials were housed in natural machines, ones that evolved here over millions of years. Their complexity far outstrips our own. We could have learned so much from them. But Baikal wanted the artificials' abilities for themselves. And based on what we found on Site 2, we know how this ended. A total collapse, a vast microbial fuel cell leaking into the ocean, eating everything away. The artificials gone, their genetic abilities used in death to save this planet's life. They died for this planet, and you are all that survives to them. Well, perhaps not all. I keep seeing the same thing mentioned in the data, the same term appearing in fragments. The oceanic mind. As far as Baikal were concerned, you were just the beginning, the first mind. The artificials were the key, inscrutable creatures with acquired power. Able to simulate, predict, and then able to change. They could rewrite life itself. For Baikal, the opportunity with this provided was clear. While the artificials were like gardeners, caretakers of this world, Baikal imagined something else. An oceanic mind, preventing total control of the ecosystem, able to enact their will. That's what they were building when the colony collapsed, and that is still out there. In the deep, powered by the heat of hydrothermal vents, the oceanic mind sleeps. I want to see it for myself, quick to know how this all ended. I've marked the approximate position on the map, way out to the north, deep in the abyss. Let me know when you are ready to see this through. Not before we analyze all of our samples. There's nothing left. The Raptis colony is a huge colonial organism made of layers of zoids, all occupying different walls within its large and complex body. Closer to a living island or iceberg than a creature, Ratis is a free-floating structure which travels across the surface of Glee's 667cc planet spanning ocean. Trying to observe the patterns of Ratis is a difficult task. I've counted tens of different zoids types flowing in constant movement throughout its cavernous interior. You can assume that they occupy the typical roles of a colonial organism, Motility, defense, digestion, and reproduction. But in a colony so vast, many other processes may be happening. Does Ratis have any neural activity? And why does it cling to the remains of the Baikal lab? Sampling some of the different zoid types may help us understand more about this colony. Sampling the colony's gas bladders has helped us to analyze how the Ratis stays afloat. It seems that thousands of these bladders of different sizes both keep Ratis at the surface and hold the fragments of the laboratory in place. These bladders, with their high oxygen content, may be inflated or deflated individually to respond to currents and move Ratis across the ocean. This suggests that Ratis has some way of orchestrating massive changes across its huge volume. In a sense, perhaps Ratis is better through thought of, an, of as an individual without a very specialized organs rather than a colony, and yet it shows no signs of a central intelligence. If I was to discover a neural activity within Ratis, could I even understand it? This creature is so alien to our way of understanding the world. Analyzing Ratis's tentacles has shown they possess an ability to secrete metal de digesting substances. The conclusion is that these tentacles are consuming the lab piece by piece, 
using it to fuel the colony's incredible growth. Perhaps Swatis was once a tiny creature floating in a biologist's time. When the facility was breached, Swatis was gifted a near inexhaustible amount of metal to consume, allowing it to grow to its vast size. One day it will eat away the entire structure, its body carrying the shadow of this planet's first human settlement. Sometimes I wish that our marks on Earth could be erased so easily, but the only shadows in our oceans are those of thousands of extinct species we will never regain. To the warm a long, thin segment of creatures that live deep in dark tunnels and oasis the rock pillar found in a least reef. Analysis of a pillar worm's kittenous plate shows a creature heavily adapted to its barren lifestyle. It seems that the hiddenous plates found around the organism's head are precisely grooved, allowing the worm to chip away at extinct recesses to create tunnels and funneling the sediment back toward the entrance. These grooves should also help protect the creature's head from abrasions while traversing the burrows. It's logical that, then that these bugs create the tunnels that other live, especially uh, the silken tendrils and the petal gardens require. They must be one of the foundations of this unique ec ecosystem, turning the hard rock pillars into vertical gardens through the obsessive barreling. Okay, I'll take a little sample. Let me know. Okay, but that's gonna be it for today, so thank you very much. Stay alive and see you soon. Bye!